Hey, welcome back everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Today is part of a really cool thing. It's Nonprofit Power Week. And we are here with one of our new best friends, Ben Hayes, manager with your part-time controller. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, Julia. Happy to be here. I'm thrilled to have you here because in the green room, we're chit-chatting and getting ready. I always say, oh, by the way, where are you from? And it turns out you're from my hometown just down the street. Yeah, I, I've been here in Arizona, Phoenix area for 25 plus years and love, love the valley. It's become my new home, even though I grew up in Colorado. Amazing. Well, we're happy to call you a native. I'm just going to put it out there and we'll just call you one of our own. Well, today, Ben, you're going to be helping us to get through how technology is really a true financial tool. And I think a lot of times, and we were chatting about this earlier, we don't think of technology as a part of our financial tool belt. We kind of think of it in, in other ways. And so this is going to be a great conversation to really learn how maybe some of us can reframe how we're thinking about technology. And you're going to help us with that. Um, this is a heavy lift and it's going to go by really quickly. Before we get going, I want to make sure that I extend our gratitude to our presenting sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staff and Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller, where Ben is joining us from. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and we have this amazing complement of co-hosts. They come from all over the country. They're incredibly diverse in the areas that they serve in, and their thought leadership is amazing. Ben Hayes, you are amazing. As a manager with your part-time controller, what is it that you do, my friend? My role is to help our associates and staff accountants get the resources they need to deliver the support to their clients. I also help our clients with their issues, their problems, accept feedback on our services and, and pass that feedback along to our associates and staff accountants so that we make sure we're giving each one of our clients the service that they want and need to move their nonprofit forward. Awesome. Are you working predominantly in the Southwest or do your clients come from all over? How all do you do that? Yeah, most of my clients are here locally in Arizona or New Mexico. Okay. Our account staff accountants and associates, however, are all over the country. So I do get to work with some that are not here locally. And, and that's a treat just to get to meet people from other parts of the country within our firm. Okay, not to put you on the spot, but I'm putting you on the spot. How many um, team members do you does YPTC now ha have? We're quickly approaching 800, so growing. No, that I was like thinking, oh, it's got to be around four to five hundred by now. That's amazing. Yes, the growth has been insane, and we're looking to continue to hire good accountants. Always looking. Okay. Okay. Well, we've, we've called that out because as we know, we're going to explore today um, and not everybody understands this, but accounting and finance for nonprofits, it's pretty different, isn't it? Yeah, it is. The foundation is similar. So if you know accounting, debits and credits and financial statements, you can have that as your solid base. And then YPTC can help you add in those nonprofit pieces that are specific to the nonprofit world because they do use different names for their financial statements. And there's right. a couple of different accounts. Right. Well, I think that's been one of the most interesting things over the trajectory of, of my community service is to see how different just the nomenclature is. You know, we use different words when we're talking about nonprofits, but from from for profits, but it's actually means the same thing. And we kind of have to retool our brains to hear different words and understand what they mean. Um, and so really interesting to be thinking about that. Well, let's dig in because we have not a lot of time with you, but you're going to help us understand that technology and data are the new keys to nonprofit success. What do you mean by that? 
So data is like gold for any organization, especially a nonprofit organization. And the first step is to make sure you're gathering that data. And then after that, what do I do with the data? How can I make it meaningful? How can I understand the story behind the data? And what technology can I use to make that a seamless process or to be able to automate the process so that it doesn't require additional human capital? And so we, there's three key steps in this. First is gathering the data. Second is there's an acronym called ETL, which is extract, transform, and load. And then lastly, deliver the information to the end user. So I've got to ask this question. If you are new to this concept, I mean, you know that you need to have the, the metrics that you're going to garner from your data and you've got to figure all this out. How do you start? Like, how do you begin to even understand what it is you should be collecting? Because you can't do it all at once, right? Right. Interestingly enough, in the process, usually you start at the end, which is the delivery. Okay. So you think about what is it that I need to know and mm -hmm. what would I like that to look like? Who's my audience? And then you work backwards to, okay, how am I going to make that presentation and where am I going to get the data from? Mm -hmm. I think also a key is don't be afraid of technology. A lot of times people say, oh, technology, that's evil. It can't be trusted. Just lean in, accept that technology is here and it's here to make those mundane tasks more easy or easier for you so that you can spend more time on the strategic thinking and the analysis. You know, I think that's good advice because there is so much fear. And let's face it, the nonprofit sector doesn't necessarily lean into change and innovation like other parts of, you know, the general economy. 1.8 million nonprofits were such an economic engine in this nation. We do so many things and yet we kind of hogtie ourselves so much by not leaning into technology. And so it's interesting that you would, you know, kind of give us that advice and help us to understand that. I want to move into the next big part and you cannot watch the news. You cannot talk, read your news feeds, you know, read the newspaper, magazines. AI is everywhere. It's changing every minute. Our perception of it is changing. And you talk about fear how can AI streamline financial processes? Because again, there's a lot of fear there. Yeah, that's a great question. AI is, a, is growing and changing almost by the minute. So mm -hmm. I obviously don't have all the answers, but we're leaning into AI to help make our jobs easier. Just a couple of examples is AI can help to automate reading of invoices to get it into your accounting software so you don't have to have someone who's manually inputting invoice data or bills secondly you can use ai to help you analyze your financial statements again use caution because you don't want to be putting your financial information out onto the internet for everybody to see but you make it anonymous as you put it in and just ask hey how do I look compared to other nonprofits that have this same mission? And it starts to help you see some trends and analyze maybe variances that you don't know about because you don't have the whole data set of all nonprofits in your area. But AI can help you find that quickly and easily and help compare you to other nonprofits that are similar mission. OK, holy moly, this is a hair and fire moment for me. I would have never thought about the comparative nature using AI to do a comparative from the perspective of the financial um, process. I think that's riveting and pretty, pretty cutting edge. Yeah, it's 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 awesome, actually, just yeah. to be able to have at your fingertips this tool yeah. that quickly can look at your financials and say, hey, Here's what other organizations in your field are doing. And here's where you are excelling maybe against them. Here's where you might have some opportunities for improvement or change in strategy to become better. 
Wow. Okay. So if you're, if you're thinking about that in, in one of a, a very wise CPA who's passed away told me years ago when, and he was actually speaking to a board um, that I sat on after an audit. And he said, the charge here is to be looking at trends. Don't get into the weeds about how much you spent buying paper clips, but look at the trends, look at the general direction that the organization is going so that you can figure out how to be more strategic. And by your example that you just gave me, it makes me think that we can use this tool to accomplish that like that. Exactly. And the good news is by being able to do that quickly and not requiring a lot of human capital, it allows your human capital to spend the time analyzing the results that come up from the AI analysis, which then you can turn into actionable items, actionable strategy to improve your organization. Right. I love that. Now, I got to before we go on, I got to ask this question. How sophisticated do you need to be in order to um, analyze this data or even understand it, right? I mean, somebody outside of a financial team um, or accounting team, whether they're remote or they're internal, how, how likely is it that our teams are going to be able to understand this information that we're presented with? So this is a great opportunity for accountants who speak the number language to make sure they're concise and what they're asking AI to do, because AI okay. will give you back what they think you're asking. So you, it, there is an art to yes. asking the right questions to get the answers. And then it may come back in accounting language. So it's an opportunity for the accountants to then say, okay, who's my audience and how do I tell this story in a language that they understand? Because let's face it, accounting is its own language. Yes. And yeah. the accountants that strive are those that can turn that into a language that others understand. For example, most board members may not have an accounting background sure. that are serving on nonprofits. So you need to make sure they understand what the data is that you're providing them. And so that's, that's also an art form and an opportunity for accountants. You know, it's in AI, it's all about the prompt. I mean, Correct. it's all about that prompt, how you ask a question, how you refine a question, even setting the tone, even setting the degree of sophistication within the vocabulary that's going to be used. Um, really an amazing thing. Again, one more question uh, for you before we go on. What should our degree of confidence be when we're looking at at the information that's I don't want to use the word regurgitated, but you know that is sent back out to, or delivered out, delivered is a better word that's delivered to us. You know, as a as somebody who's a financial expert um, with YPTC, how confident should we be when we're getting this information back? That's a great question. So again, you need to have some lens of skepticism when you get something back from the AI yeah. and ask for its sources. That again gives you a, re a roadmap where you can go and verify yourself. Okay. Is this a reputable source? And can I find this data as well? You can't blindly trust AI because it will give you stuff that's not true. <laughs> Newsflash, everything on the internet is not true. <laughs> wow, second hair on fire moment in one show. Yeah, so it's, it, it is important to check the sources and make sure that what you got back is reputable and can be relied upon. Wow, Ben, I never thought, I mean, I never thought to put that in a prompt to cite the sources. That's like super genius. Super genius. That that's a huge. No matter what you're doing um, with your AI partner or how you're using it, that's just a great overall strategy. I mean, maybe I'm late to the game, but um, I love that. I love that you that you added that in, especially if we're looking at comparatives to other organizations in our communities, in our region, across the nation 
across the world. I mean, really an interesting thing to be looking at. Okay, let's talk about this a little bit more. We talked about understanding, you know, what information is coming back, but talking about accuracy and efficiency, you know, we, rightfully so, we're so concerned about fraud and we're so concerned about mismanagement. How do all of these layers fit into this? Great question. So AI and automation tools are there to help make our jobs easier. As humans, we can make mistakes. We're prone to error. So to the effect that we can create automated processes to get accounting data into our accounting system to record transactions allows us to take that human component out and get accurate data in. And then our role as the human is to analyze that data when we're doing our reconciliations, looking at the financial reports to make sure it makes sense. Additionally, nowadays, auditors are able to use AI to look for inconsistent patterns in data that can help recognize fraud or inconsistencies within the accounting data. So AI is helping to improve our ability to catch errors, catch instances of fraud or mismanagement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I find that very interesting because I would have said um, that's not that's not one of the benefits. You know, it seems to me that a lot of times through an audit or something really crazy, we find these errors and it could be mundane or it can be really pernicious. It can be, you know, straight out fraud. It seems to me like these things take so long to uncover and, you know, historically, right? But maybe with with using this technology, we're going to uncover some of these things a lot more rapidly. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So it maybe helps to stop the problem before it becomes mm -hmm. huge and you're like, ah, where'd all the money go? Instead, right. you can catch it up front. Obviously, criminals are always uh, at one step ahead of the game. So you have to still be vigilant and watching over, making sure the data is safe, secure. It's telling you really what is happening. We always tell our people, you always want to look at reconciliations with a healthy skepticism or a healthy mind skepticism mindset, not just push the buttons. Yeah, bank account reconciles really pay attention to what's in there so that you can maybe see these in discrepancies or patterns that don't really make sense for the organization that you're working with. Yeah, that's, um, that's wise counsel because um, it just seems like things snowball and then you get, you get so far behind the gun when you do have a problem. A lot of times it's really tough to make a correction. And then I always think, you know, for those organizations that have suffered a, a problem, it's even worse when you have to go back out to your constituency, your stakeholders, your funders, your donors, and um, man up that this has occurred, which you have to. That's the that's being transparent, um, and that's that can just be devastating on so many levels. But if you can navigate some of these things before they become a big problem you're ahead of the game. Yeah, so t you could say that technology is helping your organization be sustainable. So you can get ahead of those potential issues. And you, if you do find there is an issue, you're on top of it quickly and able to alert your funders relatively quickly as well, which can help make that relationship stronger. They, they recognize humans make mistakes. Yeah. And if you're forthright and upfront about it and quick to figure it out and how you're going to fix it. Right. In most cases, they'll be understanding. So that helps to create sustainability for your organization. Yeah. I love that you framed it that way because um, the other part of this that I think you're intimating here is that, um, you know, by navigating a problem and a solution and then sharing it with the community, you're making other nonprofits and funders stronger and better 
and uh, ultimately more successful. And so I appreciate you kind of linking that back for us um, because in, in one way that is a, um, a strategy that we need to all kind of embrace as opposed to being so secretive because it ultimately does us no good. It's, it's a tough thing. We don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to spend the remaining time about communication because this is one of the things that I feel like, and you alluded to this in the very beginning part of the show, you know, we have fear when it comes to financial concepts. I think a lot of that is egocentric. You know, we don't want to look dumb. We don't want to ask questions that we are like, oh God, this is going to make me sound like an idiot because I don't know, you know, I should know this, but I don't. So how do I ask? And, and then um, interpretation. Oh, I read that differently. I thought we had tons of money. Oh, no, we don't. I mean, there's all these things. So talk to us about data viz and what it is and why we need to be embracing this. So data visualization is a way to show financial numbers in a picture or a graphic to help convey a message to your audience that is non that is financial in nature, but in a non-financial way. We have a standard that we follow here at your part-time controller. We call it the JD standard that gives us five things that we want to make sure we have in every data viz that we provide to an audience. And one of those main things is the headline so that somebody could look at that headline and they know the story from the headline. And then the graph or the visual is just a depiction of that headline. And maybe you add a little more commentary underneath the headline to give a little more context. But you want to keep it simple. Don't have data visualization to have data visualization. You want to make sure you're very simple and concise in the message that you're conveying. And it should be something important. You mentioned earlier an, a example where they say, oh, I thought we had more cash than we did. Yes. For data visualization, you could have a headline. We have cash in, available for 88 <laughs> days. Like we cover our expenses for 88 days, assuming nothing else comes in. Well, that's important information for the board, the executive team to know that, yes. hey, okay, we got to go find more funds or we're going to be out of business in less than 90 days. So that's the type of information that you can highlight in a data visualization. Do you have any, and again, this is kind of like, might seem like a wackadoo question, but when I think about going through audits or the financial statements, I mean, a lot of times it's just like tons and tons of paper that you're taking other pieces of paper to line up the lines, to try and figure out, to read it, to, you know, absorb all this. Do you have a, an idea for how much information somebody can actually take in and evaluate and then really use to the best strategic point of the organization? When we're talking about data vis vis visualization, how many of these tools should we be using? Yeah, great question. So the financial statements, especially an audited group of financial statements, has a lot, a lot, a lot of information yeah. and a lot of numbers, which can be overwhelming to sit down and read, especially if you're not an accountant. I mean, we, we dig numbers. We love financial statements. But that's not where you're going to find the key information. It's just reporting history. My feel for this is somebody can take in one or two key points and really internalize to be able to use to make decisions. So for the period you're reporting, I say find those two most important uh, stories and how can you illustrate that in a graphic with a great headline that tells the story in the headline, less than a sentence, usually just a statement. And pull those two things out and say, here's what you need to focus on and stick that on the front. All the financial data is in the back. So for those people who love detail and like looking at financial statements, they can go through them. But front and center is those two key points that I want you to focus on based on the results for this time period. Okay. Wow. That's not what I thought you would say. But when I turn it back on myself, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. I can intellectualize that. I can be thinking about it. 
that's really, really interesting because um, it's got to make for better, more generative discussions within your C-suite, within your board, within, you know, your funders, donors, stakeholders. I find that to be really um, wise, wise, a wise direction. Yeah, thank you. I believe that most of us have so much going on and with the social media, email, like 24 seven, we're bombarded with messages. We've got to make our messages quick for them to stick because we're used to that now. Our society is used to the, the quick hit. Oh, this is what I need to know. I'm on to the next thing. So keeping them short and concise and not a lot is playing into our culture. Yeah, quick to stick. That's going to be my new my new watch phrase for the week. Um, it also seems to me that if we can uh, be thinking that way, we can be more strategic about future decisions and understanding what are the right questions to ask. And I'm wondering, as we kind of get ready to finish up, how supportive or how engaged is the financial services side? Like, our bookkeepers, our accountants, our auditors, our CPAs, are they thinking in the same direction too? Because this is a new dawn, right? For all of us. How how much is this like in within your gap rules and your and just as a as a profession? Is everybody rowing in this direction? Unfortunately, no. There are slow adopters and and there's even people within the accounting community that still fear technology. Okay. I would say the younger generation is really pushing the older generation to embrace because that's what they're growing up in. That's what they're being taught in school yeah. is we're going to use technology. Yeah. It's fun to joke with people. Oh, when I took my first accounting class, it was the green ledger paper and we did our double entries by pen and pencil. Well, those days are gone. Let's let's embrace technology. Let's use it to help move the profession forward and to give better information to our organizations so they can make those right decisions to be sustainable and and serve their mission and help change the world. Yeah, it's such an interesting time, uh, Ben, to be having these discussions, to be a part of of this dialogue, because we're right in the mix of phenomenal change. You know, we haven't had a society as a whole, but especially in the nonprofit sector, we haven't had these major inputs of change, if ever, right, in such a sh short period of time. And you could talk about the pandemic, you could talk about so societal change, technology, all these different inputs, but um, really interesting to kind of leverage this change with opportunity using technology. Um, it's been really fun to have you on to kind of set that stage for us to talk about this. I've, I've really enjoyed it and quick to stick. That's going to be something I write down and put on my desk in my office because um, that makes a lot of sense when you're trying to communicate so many things and heavy concepts that we have to communicate um, in the nonprofit sector. It's not it's not easy. So this has been amazing. You know, we've had Nonprofit Power Week with YPTC. We've talked about a variety of things already in the week. If you're joining us live or on our archive, we have other episodes just on this week with these topics talking today is using tech as a financial tool. We've talked about audits and to stop stressing and how you can prep for audits, financial best practices, nonprofit budgeting. Everybody don't roll your eyes, nonprofit budgeting. You can enjoy this. It can be good. It can be a great way to really understand your organization. And then our last episode with YPTC and Nonprofit Power Week is asked and answered. And that's really interesting. I mean, it's kind of a, a grab bag of sorts with questions that come in that um, are all kind of accounting and finance oriented um, that, that have touched on maybe different parts of the week. So I encourage you to look at these different episodes and, and figure out how this these concepts can help you and your nonprofit. Wow. Okay, Ben. 
you're my new best friend because not only are you from my community, which I'm really excited. We just figured that out in the green room. But you have really taught me a lot of new things. And uh, thank you very, very much. I think this is where we need to be going in our in our beloved sector. Thank you for the opportunity to join you on the show today. It was yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Again, quick to stick, my friend. That's that's going. That's getting stuck on my computer. Um, ben Hayes, manager, your part-time controller. Check out YPTC.com. They have amazing resources. You can find archived episodes of the nonprofit show where they've been on. There's a lot of thought leadership that they do. They have blogs. They have research. Um, you don't have to be a client of theirs to get access to this amazing information. Again, YPTC.com. We have amazing partners here too, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and of course, our friends over at Your Part-Time Controller. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out. Ben, you know, you've watched episodes of The Nonprofit Show, and we end each episode with this message. And it's simple, but it's complex, kind of like accounting. It goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you again.